This is Alan Stang. Some thoughts on the energy crisis. Details in a minute. Please stick around. Alan Stang, popular author, journalist, and lecturer, is rapidly becoming even more widely known and respected as the authoritative voice of the Alan Stang Report, a three-minute syndicated radio commentary heard daily across the country as a presentation of the John Birch Society features. Packed into those brief broadcasts are powerfully revealing news stories and penetrating analyses not heard from the network sources. This is especially true regarding Allen's reports on the energy crisis that casts a dark and gloomy shadow over America's future in the 80s. Are we really running out of energy? What is behind this crisis? And what can be done about it? In recent months, Allen has had a lot to say on the subject and has given some startling answers to these questions. The John Birch Society Features has selected from a number of the Stang broadcasts and piece together what we think is a comprehensive and compelling presentation of the real nature of our energy situation. We open with Allen's reports on oil. Early in 1979, Washington was issuing grave warnings of skyrocketing fuel prices, long lines at filling stations, and the likelihood of rationing, all because America's oil supplies were critically low. But Allen Stang has repeatedly insisted that the United States has plenty of available oil. For example, John Farinaitis works for the Struthers Wells Corporation of Warren, Pennsylvania, which manufactures oil recovery equipment. On August 27th, Mr. Farinaitis was in New York, where he explained that the United States has 305 billion barrels of crude oil in the ground, which is too heavy to be recovered by ordinary means, but much of which could be pumped by steam injection methods if the price of oil averages $25 a barrel. This would save us $750 billion in foreign oil imports. Farinaitis estimates that an investment of $475 million could allow us to recover half a million barrels a day of this heavy oil simply by using special steam generators and pumps, which force steam into oil-bearing formations to thin the oil and make it flow more easily. This extra production, which could be achieved in three years, equals the federal goals for 1990, but so-called secondary recovery methods, such as steam injection and chemical methods of thinning the oil, have not been used because of the federal price ceiling of $6 per barrel for domestic crude. A presidential decontrol order issued last month was limited to the heaviest and most difficult oil to pump, rather than the most easily recovered. Meanwhile, word arrives from Washington that the geological formation which is providing Mexico with so much offshore oil is by no means confined to that country. It extends into the Gulf of Mexico and then along the Atlantic coast from Florida to Canada. H. William Menard, director of the U.S. Geological Survey, says that this area could contain as much as 15 billion barrels of oil. An area about 140 miles off New Jersey is the most promising region, he says, and it could contain as much as 6 billion barrels. In other words, the new discovery is potentially even bigger than Alaska's North Slope. At the same time, word arrives from Calgary that Dome Petroleum of Canada has made a major strike in the Beaufort Sea. Dome has found an oil pocket believed to be 200 feet thick. An exploratory well is producing at a rate of 12,000 barrels a day. By comparison, most North Sea wells average 5,000 to 10,000 barrels daily. The Dome well is located just below the Arctic Circle. And these are just the latest indications that North America is awash with petroleum. In fact, after all the petroleum we have already used, the United States still has more oil than does Saudi Arabia. During the 70s, increasing restrictions on developing domestic resources dramatically forced up our dependence on imported oil from 5% to almost 50%. Leaders in Washington then began blaming our energy problems on shortened foreign supplies. But here's what Alan Stang found. United Press International recently reported that a CIA report shows worldwide oil production was higher in January and February of this year than in the first two months of last year 
despite the drop in Iranian production. Last year, production in those months was 57.3 million barrels a day. This year, it was up to 60.1 million barrels. In a memo to Deputy Energy Secretary John O'Leary explaining the CIA figures, Lincoln Moses, head of the department's Energy Information Administration, says this, quote, I was wrong about world oil production, which these figures show to be above January and February of 1978, end quote. And it gets worse. According to another memo, this one prepared by the staff of the House Energy and Power Subcommittee, the Department of Energy deliberately covered up a one million barrel a day surge in oil imports during January and February, while at the very same time it was telling us that oil imports had fallen by as much as 500,000 barrels a day. According to the March 27th memo, a Department of Energy official told the subcommittee staff that information about the jump in crude oil imports had been withheld from Congress and the public because, quote, it would have been embarrassing, end quote. I'll say it would. It would have proved that the Energy Department is lying. In fact, says the Congressional Staff Memo, quote, U.S. imports in February 1979 were the highest in U.S. history, end quote. That's right, friends, the highest in history. But Department of Energy officials were telling us at precisely this time that the Iranian cutoff had severely reduced those imports. It was an oily lie. Your pocketbook has also noticed that the major U.S. oil companies have tried to justify an increase of almost 20% in local gasoline prices by pointing to this alleged decrease in imports. Congressional investigators say that Alvin L. Alm, an assistant secretary in the Department of Energy, has ordered his officials to distort the department's import statistics so that they will be closer to the much lower import figures the oil industry is reporting. Meanwhile, you will soon be waiting in longer and longer lines at your gas station, but not on weekends when it will be closed. Allen was right again. In May of 1979, he had to report that... Your reporter is writing and recording this in Los Angeles, where motorists are waiting in lines for as much as four hours for the right to buy gas. Some worried people have even been camping overnight at the stations. Fist fights are breaking out. At one station, a man cut in front of 50 other drivers and filled his car with gas while he held them off with a gun. The nightmare your reporter has been warning you about for years is now becoming real. Regular listeners to these broadcasts know that the gas shortage is a total fraud. And a couple of weeks ago, Jimmy Carter made that fact even more obvious than ever. On May 5th, the front page of the Los Angeles Times carried a couple of the most shocking paragraphs your reporter has ever read in a newspaper. They were in a story by Don Irwin, who writes this, quote, The nation needs a few demonstrable shortages of gasoline to be convinced it must conserve fuel, Carter said. While voluntary controls will work in most cases, the president said, a few shortages, such as the one California is now experiencing, will be necessary to prove the point, end quote. That's right, friends. That's what the president says. And it seems to mean that he wants the shortages, that the shortages are deliberately designed to bring us to our knees, deliberately designed to teach us a lesson. Remember that when he said this, he was trying to bludgeon the Congress into giving him the authority to ration. Indeed, on the next day's front page, Carter was quoted as saying this, quote, I hate to see demonstrations of shortage that arouse people's concern become the only method by which we can force Congress to act, end quote. And the key word here is method. That's what the present crisis amounts to, a method designed to panic the Congress into giving Carter the power he wants. The only way Jimmy could make that more obvious would be to slug you over the head with an empty gas can. Meanwhile, there is another big problem in Los Angeles. So much oil is arriving from Alaska that the oil companies don't know what to do with it. There isn't enough refinery capacity to process it. There isn't enough storage capacity to store it. Officials are desperately trying to find a way to get rid of it. Meanwhile, 
Angelinos are sitting in four-hour lines. Friends, your troubles are being caused by a small gang at the very top, which controls our government and oil companies, and which is manufacturing the shortage in order to get you out of your cars and enslave you. There is a conspiracy. That is admittedly incredible, but it is unfortunately true. Conspiracy, especially conspiracy between government and business giants to gain power over the people, is a hard conclusion to accept. Yet there are mountains of compelling evidence to support it. Here is some recently offered by Alan Stang. From the very beginning, the giant oil companies, dominated by the Rockefeller family's Standard Oil, have deliberately manufactured periodic crises to keep prices and profits up. They hope that by the time the next one rolls around, we will have forgotten the last. And we have. The first oil scare came in 1914. Britain, just about to enter World War I, had recently converted the Royal Navy to oil. Standard Oil announced that the United States was down to its last 517 billion barrels and that the oil would be gone in just a few years. The Bureau of Mines backed Standard up and up went the price. After the war, there was so much oil, there was danger the prices would fall. So in 1920, Standard and the other giants contrived another crisis. This time, they persuaded the U.S. Geological Survey to announce that domestic oil production would start to decline sharply within three years with no hope of recovery. Shortages like today's were reported all over the country. Gasoline was actually rationed in Oregon and California. On August 25th, 1920, the trade magazine called Automotive Industries revealed as follows, quote, It is alleged that the shortage of gasoline was fictitious and due to manipulation. Allegations are made that the refineries created the shortage by shipping gasoline from Los Angeles to northern parts of the state and then, after waiting until the price advanced, bringing it back again for sales purposes, end quote. It worked. When prices reached 37 cents a gallon, which would be at least a dollar a gallon in today's money, the phony shortage disappeared. And these are just a couple of examples of what happens with regularity every few years. Indeed, in 1950, the oil giants, using their control over the U.S. government, arranged for the deduction from their U.S. taxes on a dollar-for-dollar dollar basis of all royalties paid to the Middle East. What did this mean? A royalty paid for an oil lease in the United States can be deducted as a business expense. Since the corporate income tax is usually about 50 percent, a dollar royalty paid to Farmer Brown for the right to drill a well on his land actually costs Standard Oil 50 cents. But the entire dollar is deductible when it is paid to the Arabs, with the result that foreign oil became more profitable than domestic oil. And the giant companies went to the Middle East, largely neglecting oil exploration here in the United States. By the middle 1950s, there was a glut of oil. The giants also feared competition from the independents. So in 1959, claiming that cheap imported oil was a danger, and that the lack of domestic exploration would cause a shortage, the giants arranged an oil import quota which drastically cut our supply of cheap foreign oil. In his next report, Allen gave even more convincing evidence. In American Opinion magazine, author Gary Allen speaks of secret documents circulated in 1968 by Standard Oil of California. Those documents gravely warned industry leaders that through 1973, there would be, quote, a large potential surplus, end quote. Indeed, when Alaskan oil began to arrive, there would be, quote, extending and magnifying surplus supply problems, end quote. So standard officials suggested slashing production wherever possible. Less oil would mean higher prices and bigger profits. Along these lines, notice that the Rockefeller foundations and even many oil companies have been the leading financial angels of the ecology movement, which is anti-oil. Why? Because outfits like the Sierra Club have been restricting production, thereby pumping profits into the pockets 
of their Rockefeller bosses. Indeed, the federal government now owns up to 67% of undiscovered oil reserves, 40% of the coal, and half the uranium. So it's no wonder that the Rockefellers have spent millions allegedly to preserve the wilderness. Federal lands are loaded with energy sources which could break the energy cartel if released. Whether they know it or not, people who are working to lock up the land are doing just what David Rockefeller wants. Now we come to 1973. The Arab-Israeli war provided the excuse for an embargo because the U.S. was pro-Israel. But the Shah of Iran, where the oil giants closed down seven large fields, made it clear on U.S. television that America was being hoaxed. Asked about the embargo, he replied, quote, Why should you care about that? You are not short of oil, end quote. Indeed, the Shah said as follows when asked whether the oil giants were defrauding the public, quote, Well, something is going on for sure, end quote. Could this be a reason that Jimmy Carter, who is David Rockefeller's messenger boy, recently decided to dump the Shah? In November 1973, it was learned that U.S. oil companies had been exporting oil at a rate five times as much as normal. Indeed, on May 15, 1973, Standard of Indiana placed a full-page ad in the London Financial Times soliciting new industrial customers and promising secure supplies. Five days later, the same company bought a two-page ad in the Washington Star warning Americans that they would have to get by with less. And in March 1974, while you were waiting in lines, oil brokers in Vienna reported that American oil companies had offered two million tons of crude in European markets at prices below the then current market price. Meanwhile, two Federal Power Commission economists admitted in Senate testimony that the oil giants were withholding huge quantities of oil from production on 800,000 leased acres off the coasts of Louisiana and Texas. And the giants used the manufactured shortage to shut off supplies to hundreds of independents who went under. But the picture of a contrived crisis is even bigger than this. Here are more of Allen's findings. A big part of the problem is OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. The founder of OPEC in 1960 was Juan Pablo Perez, who many years ago was run out of Venezuela for his radical activities. Perez spent two mysterious years in New York City, after which he founded OPEC, and the distinguished journalist Gary Allen writes as follows in American Opinion magazine, quote, Juan Pablo Perez was apparently the agent of the penthouse Bolsheviks of international oil and high finance, end quote. Why? Why would the big banks and oil companies secretly create OPEC? Gary Allen puts it this way, quote, The answer is as simple as Br'er Rabbit begging not to be thrown in the briar patch. There is no other way that the Seven Sisters could have jacked the price of oil up from 88 cents a barrel to $15 without precipitating a revolution. The oil companies have had to endure some slings and arrows, but they can now get by with blaming the Arabs and the hundreds of billions of dollars they will make from OPEC's sky-high prices more than compensate for the criticism." End quote. It is perfectly true that the OPEC nations have confiscated the properties of the seven oil giants, but the change is cosmetic. The title to the wells has changed, but the seven sisters still run the show. So the problem is not just Arab oil sheiks making billions. It is also the oil giants many of whose bosses belong to David Rockefeller's Council on Foreign Relations and who are making billions by manipulating the supply and squeezing out the independence with government help. In California, the Machinists Union recently sued OPEC for price fixing. During the trial, Morris Edelman, professor of economics at MIT, an expert witness appointed by the court, presented evidence that in 1960, Soon after the creation of OPEC, the U.S. government itself, by means of a consent decree issued by the Department of Justice, permitted OPEC to fix prices. This, of course, is a violation of law in the United States. Judge A. Andrew Houck said as follows of the revelation, quote, 
It seems to me, if you are right, the executive side has approved fixing of prices by OPEC. It seems to me my hands are tied. I was astounded when I read that. I think it's a very strong indication to this court that I shouldn't stick my judicial nose in. If I do, I could get it chopped off. I must say, it's no less than a thunderbolt, end quote. That's right. The U.S. government has been in collusion with OPEC. The footprints of the conspiracy are getting obvious. So far, we have been talking about big oil. Now let's talk about the huge New York banks. Not only do all of them have representatives on the Rockefeller family's Council on Foreign Relations, which determines U.S. foreign policy, but they are virtually one entity. The biggest banks in America are so closely tied together that they control the biggest blocks of stock in each other's parent holding companies. Yes, the monster banks are one big happy family, and the giant oil companies are an important part of that family. For instance, 16 of the directors of First National City Bank sit on the boards of seven different oil companies. The megabanks also own substantial oil stocks. For instance, Chase Manhattan owns 5.5% of mobile oil, and the experts tell us that 5% of such a company is in effect controlling interest. The banks also control the oil companies by lending them money. For instance, Gulf Oil owes $21.5 million to David Rockefeller's Chase Manhattan. These are just a few of many examples, and they prove that the monster banks in New York have decisive control of big oil. Indeed, the question arises of what the Arabs do with the mountain of money they are making in royalties, much more than they are able to spend. The answer is that they deposit it in the vaults of the overseas branches of these same New York megabanks, which then lend and invest the money for additional profit. In short, not only are the huge New York banks and the oil companies enjoying vast profits, the banks are even manipulating the vast profits made by the Arabs. It's nice work if you can get it. In 1976, because of all this, a full 78% of Chase Manhattan's earnings came from foreign sources. In that year, the big six New York banks earned $640 million overseas. But they made only $364 million at home, which boils down to mean that they are American banks only in the sense that they have headquarters in New York City. Their heart is where their profits are, which is overseas. That is why they are perfectly delighted to see America go down the tubes. That is strong evidence of a conspiracy involving big oil, big banks, and big government. But what about the windfall profits tax? Won't that hurt big oil interests? Here is how Alan Stang answers. The way Jimmy Carter and the national press tell it, the seven sisters, the major oil companies, will be hit with the tax. But the windfall profits tax will be a tax on domestic oil. Domestic, that's the key word. So who produces the domestic oil in our country? The answer is that 80% of it and more is produced by the independents, the free enterprisers in the oil business, the people you never hear of. The reason for this strange arrangement is that federal policy has made it more profitable for the huge companies to go overseas, so they do. The independents are stuck here. They can't afford to get into imported oil, which the Seven Sisters control almost completely. So the independents are the victims who will be hit with this tax. Theirs are the so-called windfall profits the government will take away. The majors will be hurt very little, if at all. Now put this together with the fact that even without the tax, government regulations are already driving scores of independents out of business. 25 years ago, there were 20,000 independents. Today, there are only a little more than half as many. And friends, they're going fast. There are more than 2,800 pages of energy regulations which are knocking them off. So it is reasonable to assume that the windfall profits tax will be the straw that breaks many a camel's back. Many more independents will be driven out of business. Question, what will we have when and if we let the government finish off the remaining independents? Answer, we will have a huge monopoly, a monopoly controlled by the seven huge companies. 
we will have exactly what Jimmy Carter, Jane Fonda, and Ralph Nader claim they are fighting against. In other words, the windfall profits tax is as phony as a $1 bill. Recently, there was a big flap about oil company profits. Our liberal rulers yelled that those profits must be confiscated by the government and that the Department of Energy must be given more power. This, of course, raises the question of what the Department of Energy now takes from you and what you get back. DOE now spends $12.3 billion of your tax money. This is more money than the profits of the seven largest oil companies put together. DOE now has 23,000 employees. This means that the department is spending about $500,000 per employee. It also means that a tax of more than $50 is being slapped on every person in this country. In a recent issue of the Review of the News, we are told that the Department of Energy's budget could buy 700 million barrels of oil at today's prices. Or it could be used to drill more than 200 million feet of new wells. Or to explore and drill more than 40,000 new oil and gas wells. But the Department of Energy produces no energy whatsoever, not a drop. In fact, the energy situation is even worse than it was more than two years ago when the Department of Energy was created. We can be sure of this because the government itself says so. Friends, what would you say if the oil companies were taking $12.3 billion from you every year and giving you no gas, not a drop, in return? But that's exactly what the government is doing. Remember that your reporter has detailed the crimes of the oil companies many times over these microphones. But they look like choir boys when compared with the Department of Energy's extortion. Along these lines, let's have a look at oil company profits. Typically, the network news recently reported them in the most inflammatory way in order to pressure the passage of the windfall profits tax. What are the facts? Yes, Exxon's profits were up 119% compared with the third quarter of last year, which was a poor year. But that doesn't mean Exxon's profits were 119%. Its profit, in fact, was less than 6%, $1.145 billion on $20.6 billion in sales. The network news could have told you this, but didn't. Indeed, Exxon's U.S. refining profits were down 17% for the first nine months of 1979 as compared with last year. Its operating earnings from domestic oil and gas increased only 2.7%, while government-caused inflation was at least 14 percent. It is painfully obvious from the Alan Stang reports that government's regulatory and taxing powers are being used to perpetuate an ever-worsening energy crisis, all for the purpose of increasing government control over our economy and our lives. Let's look at another example. A couple of years ago, a deal was underway in which six United States oil companies had arranged to import two million cubic feet of gas from Mexico at two dollars and sixty cents per thousand cubic feet. The participants in the deal began to build a pipeline from Mexico to Texas. But construction stopped when Energy Secretary James Schlesinger put the kibosh on the arrangement. Schlesinger used as his excuse the fact that we were getting gas from Canada for two dollars and eighteen cents. And so according to him, Mexico was overcharging us. But in the first place, Canada has refused to increase sales to us since 1970 because of that low price. And in the second place, in 1977, when Schlesinger canceled the Mexican deal, we were importing gas from communist Algeria at a much higher price than arranged for with Mexico. So the reason for the cancellation was, as usual, a total fraud. And the result, as usual, is that you don't get the gas. Indeed, we don't really need the Mexican gas because there is enough gas to last 4,000 years off our Gulf Coast alone, when Dr. Vincent McKelvey, director of the U.S. Geological Survey, dared to mention that reserve, they fired him. For years, the immense force of the federal government has been used in every way imaginable to cripple America's development of needed energy. A major part of that effort has been carried on under the cruel ecology hoax. In February of 1979, Alan Stang gave these maddening examples. 
Regular listeners to these broadcasts have often heard your reporter discuss the snail darter. This ichthyological wonder is a variety of minnow that grows to about three inches in length. Presumably it is called the snail darter because it darts after snails. Do you get it? It sounds ridiculous, but you must admit that it all hangs together. For more information about the snail darter, please see your local ichthyologist, who is probably the only one in your town who cares. The rest of us probably never would have heard of it, except that for a couple of years, the snail darter has been locked in combat with the Teleco Dam in Tennessee. Teleco is already 95% complete, and the government has spent $113 million on it. Presumably the experts believed it was necessary when they planned it, but then along came the ecologists. The ecologists tell us that if Teleco is completed, the snail darter will be destroyed, and Americans will be denied the intense pleasure provided by this three-inch fish they have never heard of. Indeed, around the country, creatures even more outlandish are being used as the excuse to stop construction of many energy projects. In Maine, there is the Dickey Lincoln Hydroelectric Project versus the Furbish Lousewort, a noxious weed previously thought extinct and resurrected for the purpose. In Houston, there is the Houston toad, who must be protected even from himself, because he is mating with other varieties of toad, and thereby is breeding himself into extinction. Meanwhile, his human followers threaten to shut a sizable part of Houston down. In New Mexico, there is the Socorro isopod, a 14-legged water bug versus a geothermal energy project. In New Hampshire, there is the noble clam, who at least has the virtue of being edible. Sensible Americans have been so inflamed by all this that last year the Congress amended the Endangered Species Act. Now there is an Endangered Species Committee, which rules on whether such projects as Teleco may continue. And recently the committee ruled that it can't. It looks as if the snail darter has won. Maybe you would care to visit the site on your next vacation. There you could gaze at length upon the mighty snail darter as it darts after snails. There too you will enjoy the crippled dam on which the Tennessee Valley Authority has spent that hundred and thirteen million dollars. The meek may someday inherit the earth and the proof is that the snail darter is now the richest fish in the world. TVA's attorney William Willis says the committee decided to stop Teleco even after TVA came up with a different way of finishing the dam that would have saved the snail darter. Nothing could be more obvious than that the so-called endangered species are being used as an excuse to shut America down. Another hoax used to perpetuate the crippling of our energy development and our economy has been that of alternative energy, or soft energy as it is called. What does Allen have to say about this? Donald C. Winston is associate editor of a publication called London Oil Reports. Recently, Newsweek magazine published an article by him in which Mr. Winston tells us this, quote, Solar energy is potentially the most polluting and ecologically threatening form of commercial power being proposed in the world today, end quote. Indeed, Donald Winston says that solar energy, quote, may turn out to be more hazardous than nuclear, more polluting than coal, and more costly to the consuming public than petroleum, end quote. Yes, that's what the man says. Here is why. By the year 2000, the United States could get all its power from solar sources, but only if we are willing to cover an area the size of the state of Oregon with solar collectors. Even if we just wanted to replace all existing and projected nuclear power plants with solar energy, we would have to cover an area about as big as West Virginia. What would these solar conversion units be like? Well, for instance, direct conversion photovoltaic units would have to contain tons of such materials as cadmium. But in 1978, all the cadmium produced in the world could have yielded only 180,000 megawatts of installed capacity, or about 10% of world capacity that year. On top of that, in the same year, the United States had to import 
63% of its cadmium. Does this mean that with the large-scale advent of solar energy, a cadmium cartel could do to us what OPEC is doing now? On the other hand, we could use thermal conversion units, but they would be made of thousands of tons of glass, plastics, and rubber. Millions of tons of toxic freon, or something like it, would run through many miles of complicated plumbing. It is obvious that the manufacture and maintenance of a monstrosity such as this would produce more pollution than the world has ever seen. Donald Winston asks the following questions, quote, Why do so many of the people who fear the effect of drugstore deodorant spray cans on the ozone layer rush to risk a massive freon spill on Earth? Why are so many of those who tremble in terror over the Three Mile Island accident, which killed nobody, ecstatic about the prospect of putting tons of silicate particles into the air we breathe? Why are those so quick to protect the wilderness from a single pipeline so anxious to smother it with solar cells?" End quote. These are all excellent questions. Along these lines, a report now arrives from the front lines on the wind power that Jane Fonda wants you to use instead of nuclear. Astrid Running, the writer, lives on an island off the Connecticut coast with her husband, Frank Converse, the actor. In the Chicago Tribune on October 5th, she writes that since her husband is hostile to utility companies, he arranged for a wind generator to supply electricity to their home. Miss Running writes that they had to shut the refrigerator off at night, that she had to read the water levels daily in each of 19 batteries that the gas generator needed an oil change every 35 hours, made conversation impossible, and finally fell apart. She writes as follows, quote, We are now living out of coolers and ice buckets, and the house hasn't been vacuumed in two months. We are childishly not speaking to the windmill people, nor they to us, end quote. And just think, the experiment only cost the lucky couple a mere $12,000. The victim also tells us this, quote, For the amount of money we've spent so far on the windmill project, we could have paid for three electric lines from shore and had the convenience of being able to run the refrigerator and the vacuum at the same time, end quote. The next logical question is raised by Alan Stang himself and then answered very rationally. How safe or how dangerous is nuclear power? The recent nuclear accident in Pennsylvania again raises the question of nuclear safety. The foes of nuclear power are now drooling with delight. They screech that the accident proves nuclear power is dangerous. And friends, they are right. Nuclear power is dangerous, exactly as they say. So this is the place to remind you of some obvious things they don't say. First, remember that there is no such thing as a fuel that isn't dangerous. A safe fuel is a contradiction. It could not exist. The term safe fuel makes about as much sense as dry rain or tall midgets. If something isn't dangerous, it isn't fuel. It can't be fuel. Not only is all fuel dangerous, it must be dangerous. In fact, it is the dangerous element in fuel that makes it fuel. The reason for this is that energy is potentially dangerous. When it gets out of control, it can and does cause trouble. And you knew all this when your reporter started talking. It's obvious. So the safety the anti-energy revolutionaries really want is the spurious safety of the cave. It is perfectly true that if we abolished nuclear power, stopped mining coal, outlawed natural gas and petroleum, and went back to the caves, we no longer would face the dangers of energy. We would face the even greater dangers of disease, starvation, and freezing to death. So the realistic question to ask is not whether nuclear power is potentially dangerous. Of course it is. The realistic question is which form of presently available energy is safest? Which is the most dangerous type of fuel? Look at the record. The record shows that coal has killed many thousands over the years. Mining accidents unfortunately are commonplace. Coal miners are constantly buried alive. But the revolutionaries haven't said that we must stop mining coal, at least not yet. Indeed, did you know that far more radioactivity in the form of ash comes from a coal-generated power plant every day 
than a nuclear power plant produces. The anti-energy fanatics so far haven't said a word. And this is just one example. All the other fuels have killed many thousands. Remember the fuel truck that recently killed scores of picnickers in Spain? Needless to say, petroleum can be very dangerous. Friends, even wood is dangerous, precisely because it burns. If it didn't burn, it wouldn't be fuel. Wood has killed more people than nuclear power has. Even solar power would be dangerous. So far, nuclear power is the safest form of available fuel. That is precisely why the anti-energy, anti-Americans are against it. It is safer and it is available. Yesterday, as you will recall, we began to compare the safety of nuclear power with that of other fuels in view of the recent accident in Pennsylvania. And now that the accident happily seems over, the time has come to sum it up. How many people were killed? As far as we know, none. How many people were injured? As far as we know, again, none. Well then, how much property was destroyed? How much damage was done? Once again, the answer is none. In other words, the perfect record of nuclear energy from the very beginning remains intact, while coal, oil, and the other fuels have been killing many thousands and destroying millions of dollars worth of property, nuclear power, as far as we know, has yet to claim its first victim. Remember that we are not claiming that nuclear power is safe. All fuel is dangerous, but it is far and away safer than any other fuel now available. The question arises of how much radioactivity people in the area may have received. The Los Angeles Times tells us that according to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the highest concentration of radiation was registered at the nuclear plant site where officials measured 70 millirems of radioactivity. How much radioactivity is that? Well, for instance, a routine chest x-ray will subject you to as much as 30 millirems. So somebody at the nuclear plant itself would have received a little more than the equivalent of a couple of those x-rays. Indeed, the Times told us the next day of readings as low as one millirem. And according to the experts, 200 millirems a year are safe. If all this is true, it is fair to say that the potential disaster in Pennsylvania did not amount to much. Indeed, it is possible to argue that the successful solution to the problem is proof that nuclear energy not only works better and safer, but also cleaner. Yet, the anti-energy revolutionaries are using the Three Mile Island accident as an excuse to destroy nuclear power completely. Friends, we have to decide whether we want the non-existent safety of having no energy at all, a choice that would destroy the standard of living we love, or whether we love it enough to take the risks of keeping it. We can't have it both ways. It cannot be repeated too much that the real purpose of many of the leaders of the anti-nuclear movement is not really to get us safe power. Safe power is just the excuse they are using. Their real purpose is to destroy America by denying us the energy we need to survive. If solar power were feasible, they would come out against it. Is there an answer to our growing energy crisis? Alan Stang discusses this in the following report. Outright socialists tell us that the solution to the energy crisis is a government takeover of the oil companies. But this would create a crisis that would make today's problem look like abundance. Indeed, the government already runs the show. Outright nationalization would just make it official. For the same reason, divestiture, in which the companies would be broken up, is not the answer. Divestiture would have to be arranged by the government. And as we have seen, government is the problem. Government has been the problem from the beginning. The crimes of the megabanks and big oil have been blamed on free enterprise, when in fact they have betrayed free enterprise. It was the original John D. Rockefeller who said, quote, competition is a sin, end quote. The secret to the monopoly of the oil giants is that they have used government regulation to protect themselves and at the same time stifle competitors. The press releases in which they sometimes grumble about the government are deliberately designed to throw you off the track. In February 1976, Fortune magazine ran an article by Thornton Bradshaw, 
president of Atlantic Richfield, who says, quote, What I am suggesting is that the enterprise system cannot function properly without the right kind of government intervention at the right time and in the right degree, end quote. And experience shows that this means intervention on behalf of Atlantic Richfield and the other oil giants. Big business just loves big government. It is big government that is restricting production of the abundance of energy we have by means of the disastrous Carter Energy Law, with the predictable result that prices are rising and the oil independents are being forced out. The one thing the oil giants really fear is a free competitive market in which smaller, aggressive, and innovative companies could outmaneuver the powerful but ponderous giants. One technical breakthrough could cost the oil giants billions in much the same way that development of the gasoline engine made steam power obsolete. But notice that while the liberals debate about how to break up the oil cartel, they take great care never to mention this one thing the cartel fears most, a free market in energy. No matter how big the oil giants are, they can't control a truly free market. As we have seen, the so-called liberals are working in the ecology movement, which is financed by the oil giants, allegedly to protect our scenic wonders, but which in fact is creating the shortages the oil giants want. The only solution is to get the government out now. We agree. The only solution to the energy crisis is to get the government and all its regulatory destructiveness out of the way of production completely, and then to let free enterprise go to work on correcting the disastrous situation that government controls have created. But accomplishing this will take a lot of effort and support. This is Alan Stang. Think about it.